All right, and we're on air. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Bibliomancy for Beginners. We are a bi-weekly book club who this summer are focusing on reading diverse books. I'm going to let our lovely hosts introduce themselves, starting with Gretchen. Hello, I am Gretchen from the blog My Life is a Notebook. Um, and this week's book is my pick, and so memorize the loveliness of my face and the, the beard on Taylor's, because <laughs> one of us will probably die this episode as we fight for the day. So... <laughs> That's 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 my own warning for this episode, and you're welcome. <laughs> Are you threatening my beard? <laughs> no, that's just the only memorable part of your face. Oh no! I don't even know if that's an insult. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm Michaela. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm from the blog The Pied Piper Calls. Um, yeah, that's all I gotta say. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stay out of that little tussle that's happening over there. Oh, um, well, I'm Taylor. Lovely to meet you all. I'm glad you could make it uh, tonight to help me through. I've got the emotional crutch of a nice bosun chocolate stout. So I'm gonna be working through a pint of that over the next hour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm ready to get going. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, today we read An Ember in the Ashes by Sabah Tahir. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, we always give spoiler-free recommendations before we talk about the book in more detail, and I'm also going to read the Goodreads description for you now so that you sort of have a basis about um, whether or not you care if you want to read it or not. Alrighty. Uh, Laia is a slave. Elias is a soldier. Neither is free. Under the martial empire, defiance is met with death. Those who do not vow their blood and bodies to the emperor risk the execution of their loved ones and the destruction of all they hold dear. It is in this brutal world, inspired by ancient Rome, that Laia lives with her grandparents and older brother. The family ekes out an existence in the Empire's impoverished back streets. They do not challenge the Empire. They've seen what happens to those who do. But when Lyra's bro Lyra's brother is arrested for treason, Lyra is forced to make a decision in exchange for help from rebels who promise to rescue her brother. She will risk her life to spy for them from within the Empire's greatest military academy. There, Lyra meets Elias, the school's finest soldier, and secretly, it's most unwilling. Elias wants only to be free of the tyranny he's been trained to enforce. He and Laia will soon realize that their dis destinies are intertwined and that their choices will change the fate of the Empire itself. Um, and then, Gretchen, do you want to give your overall impression? Um, so I am going to be the only one who is going to say that I liked this book. Um, I and I know that already, and it's fine. Um, as the only habitual YA reader, that's going to happen. Um, in terms of a lot of YA that's out there right now, I found this book very promising, especially because this is a debut, um, and I was really, really intrigued by the quality of it, um, in that sense. So when I give it like a four star on Goodreads for a debut, like if it wasn't a debut, I might have given it like a three, um, maybe, but I am hopeful because I liked it. Um, and then everything changed when the love triangles attacked. Um, <laughs> basically, it's a book full of promise that got trampled on by a bunch of tropes that for some reason, I guess, publishers just sit there and they're like, I'm sorry, your book does not contain a love triangle, please add three. And it's like, why? Why? <laughs> um, but if you like fantasy YA, my thing is still going to be, you should read it. Um, I was very impressed. I liked it a lot. Um, the world has promise. The characters have promise. And I think that her writing is only going to get better from here on out. All right. Um, 
Like Gretchen says, she's the only one that habitually reads YA, and I used to read a lot of YA, but I, <clears throat> as the years have gone by, have gotten very tired of it for the very reason that she says that there are these tropes that exist in the genre. And this book was like, let's just take this trope and then put this trope on top of it and then take this trope and put that on top of it and add this trope as well. And it annoyed me. There were points that I really enjoyed. There were, there were things about the world and things about this plot that I kind of enjoyed. But overall, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> And it might be my own distaste for the tropiness of the genre. It might be that this book got trampled over by editors who wanted more tropes in there because it needs to be that way because of YA. I don't know. But it was not my favorite YA book. I could give you a list of others that I really enjoyed much more than this one to read if I was to be honest. That's it. Well... I was not crazy about this book, and that is not because I found it to be poorly written. I think the author is technically uh, very skilled. However, for reasons we have already mentioned, especially the not one, but two love triangles, and uh, love triangles aren't really something I have much patience to begin with. Um, ah! <laughs> Even Gretchen doesn't like um, the love triangles, so... But... I think the reason why I found so little enjoyment is that the great majority of this book, for no reason apparent to me, became consumed with this romantic dynamic between the two main characters and then their subsequent two characters that they, you know... That thing, I'm, I'm muddling how this love triangle situation is going down. Mm -hmm. The point being, if we had removed that utterly, we would have had a book about the third of the length, which would have allowed us to include what's going to be in the sequel, mm -hmm. and actually have a coherent story where maybe something happens. So all I can say is I wish for so much more from this, mm -hmm. but it was really weighed down by things I don't think were serving it in any way. Right. Okay. Now here's a disclaimer. This is a book club, therefore we'll be discussing the characters and events of the novel. If you don't wish to be spoiled, then you should stop watching and come back once you have. Um, it's to be expected here... We're discussing the book. That's what we want to do here. Um, there's also probably going to be some swearing because we're college students and adults and we're allowed to do that. Um, and it's not impossible to conduct ourselves professionally when some of us get angry. So there's that. Um, if you would like to join us for our next book club, um, well prepared so that you don't have to leave now that you've found us. Um, I have a Goodreads group and a link in the bottom that has all of our social media and stuff where it's listed every single book that we're planning to read this summer so that you can read it ahead of time and join us for our scheduled live stream live and chat with us while we're streaming if you so choose to do so. Um, this is the point where the spoilers will begin. So, Anyang, to those of you who don't want to be spoilered, spoilered? Spoiled? That's the word, um, and we'll get into it. Gretchen, we always start with our favorite part. What was your favorite part? Favorite part? <laughs> oh, no, she just looks to the side. No, I'm thinking. I just, like, I, um, for those of you who don't know, I had surgery um, right after our last live stream. And I was on these painkillers that literally took me out for two weeks. So I literally had to read this book in three hours this afternoon. And it was it was a little bit um a little bit blurry. Um but so I'm just like trying to pick out like a particular scene. A particular part that was my favorite. And it was probably the ending. Um because the ending was where all of the sudden the characters were like, I'm going to stop waiting for things to happen to me and make things happen myself. Um, thereby proving that they could actually do that. Because I think 
honestly, my thought, if that ending hadn't happened the way that it had, I would have been like, I don't want to read the sequel because these characters, like, don't do anything. They just whirl around in the plot like they're whirlpools. Um, and they're just, like, not doing anything. Um, so I really liked the ending because it was when a lot of my, my hope in what are two well-crafted characters really came into play. Um, I will say that I really appreciated the supernatural elements of this book. Um, I think that was my favorite part because I always appreciate when somebody picks a specific religion's or ethnicities like, um, like, I don't know. Mythologies? Yeah, like their mythologies. So like Jinn and like Ifrits, like those belong to a specific culture and it wasn't like, it's not a commonly used supernatural element is like what I'm saying. So I appreciated that showing up and being used properly and used in a setting where it's appropriate and not just thrown in for the hell of it. If that makes sense. Like I, I really appreciated that, and I mm -hmm. think they, they were used well for this book and its world and its plot. If that makes sense, if slightly confusing. I definitely think they uh, were used coherently and drove to a greater thing. I'm not sure. I mean, if we're allowed to now actually just talk about the book, I'm not sure how. Uh, on board with the conceit that oh, the reason that these people were subjugated is because the genie were angry at them from generations ago, so they got the Roman Empire to conquer them. And I'm like, do we even need this? Like, <laughs> is it not enough that these guys are conquerors? Do we need an evil demon packet as well? Maybe? I, yeah, I, I, I can agree that, like, they didn't necessarily need to be used in that way, but I appreciate that they existed in a proper way, if that makes sense. That it wasn't just, yeah. oh, yeah, these also exist. We're not really going to talk about them. They're there, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, they were definitely seeded and then established as part of the kind of story, folklore, and then brought into something larger. Yeah. So in that sense, well done. Um, I guess I have a favorite part, actually. Or, well, really? A, a part that stood out to me above the others, and I think it was the first trial? Maybe was, it was the second yeah. trial. When it was, you know, chucked him out into the desert? First trial. It was the first one. First trial. And I think, perhaps because that's one where they were actively working towards something out in a threat, like, you know, a dangerous situation, and there was some interesting different things going on, but at the same time, it still kind of fell down into Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire without the kind of fun and mystery of these trials that I got in Harry Potter. Hmm. I was going to say that, like, my favorite scene was that... that trial as well. Like, that's the one that I enjoyed the most as, like, a idea of, like, what what a trial would be. Face your most yeah. hated fear, and, like, everybody has to do something different. It's not just, like, we're all gonna dump you all in yeah. one spot, and you'll have to fight. But it's like, then once you overcome it, you also need to walk back to the city in time. Yeah. <laughs> you and that actually stood out to me, because that seemed like a fully realized, you know, thing to be done. Yes. As opposed to some ghost people are just gonna try to assassinate you. <laughs> don't don't get injured, I guess. <laughs> Have fun with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um least favorite part and rants. Alright, friends. <laughs> 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 oh. oh. I believe in healthy support and also healthy criticism, so mm -hmm. sit down. Uh, <laughs> get ready, get food, whatever. Um, I guess Taylor mentioned that he kind of wanted to talk about the love the hexagon, the multi love tri the love pentagram. I don't know <laughs> what the frickety fracty was going on there. 
of triangles. I of love. Too too, too much too many too much geometry. Um because like you have Elias and there's Helene, but Elias says he doesn't love Helene, but then he's confused about his feelings for Helene, and then he's like, No, you're mad at me because I don't love you, and I'm like, wait, what? That was the most frustrating. Can we stop at that moment where he's like, I'm angry because you're in love with me, and that's not fair, and it makes me like stupid and think about things and like what is going on? <laughs> this guy has talked to us at multiple times about how he's slept with multiple people. Why does... Hold on, I'm... Yeah, like, at the beginning, when that random-ass Marcus, like, kisses her, uh, dude's just like, uh, well, maybe you just need someone else to kiss you now to make it better, right? <laughs> I'm like, what am I reading? <laughs> What is this disconnect between the experience this guy is claiming? Or, like, not even claiming this isn't him being all blustery. This is just an established thing. And then he's consistently talking like a 13-year-old who has never once been within five feet of a girl. Hmm. Gretchen, I'm sorry for piggybacking, like, blindfolding and then stealing your rat. (laughs) No, it's fine, because, I mean, I, I have a lot to say, and that's fine, because that, that I just, I was, I was just so confused. Because then, like, you have the whole thing with Elia, which is the first time he sees her, he's like, man, I want a banger. And I'm just oh like, my god, I hated that scene. I, was, I tweeted about it, I was like, this is the most uncomfortable thing I have ever read. That was so gross. <laughs> <laughs> not a fan not a fan <laughs> well and then you have Laya who's like man his voice is hypnotic but there's this redhead over here who like gets me um, don't forget how he also spells like spice and rain oh my god and if anything is a YA love description it's that someone smells like spice and rain I just like I have written multiple blog posts on this. I have talked about this in an academic setting. Part of my presentation that I did was just like, what is with the fucking love triangles? Like, can we not? Can we stop? So here is where I will defend a specific type of love triangle. Not all love triangles, but a specific type of love triangle. Not all love triangles, you say? (laughs) Not all love triangles are created equal. Polishing your fedora. I have a list of books that have done love triangles correctly because I do agree that they exist sometimes where they are necessary or helpful. They they are necessary and helpful less than they are created most often for like like drama. Like one person likes this other person, but this other person doesn't like them back. Like like I hate that. But there are specific uses where it's allowing the reader to root for different people. Like, I, I like that guy as opposed mm-hmm. to that guy. And it's not one person liking another person and creating drama in the situation. It's just like, she could date that guy or she could date that guy. And either of them are really an option. But depending on who you are as a mm-hmm. reader, you'll be rooting for one person more than another. If that makes sense. Like, it's completely... Yeah taken out of the plot, like, it's not important at all. Yeah. It's just there as an option. Uh, I would also say what rubbed me the wrong way about these love triangles is that in many ways they were important to the plot because both characters were torn between two worlds and two <laughs> the two people they were in love with were from some very different worlds and these are the things that they must choose between. And maybe if it was one character, it's something I could forgive, but when they both have the exact same roots in either end of either the Legionnaires, where you were either a member and in love with a member, or the Resistance, where you were a member and a member of that, and in love with the opposite person. And it was just heavy-handed, and it didn't actually serve anything. Mm -hmm. No one ever had to think, well, maybe I'm going to join that other people. It was just... Elias, like, well, I want to defect, but wait, I can get throughout some very plot-convenient loophole where if she's in charge, she can let me go because 
Apparently it's some leftover of a rule that no one bothered to change that it was just very casually mentioned to me by Lena. I'm going to keep talking about this because I am frustrated. I just like, and for me too, it was one of those things where it was so obvious that these relationships didn't have to be this way for the plot to do the exact same thing. Because like, Helene, like there are so, there are so many more this is kind of like dipping into like characters for a second because I mm -hmm. felt like a lot of the main characters actually had a very nuanced characterization. Yeah. Like, because in a lot of YA novels, that is not the case. You can fit them into a box of like a cliche. And while that cert that did happen at times, like, like the commandant, like, like that scene at the mm. end in the that was just like all right you know there was a distinct attempt to make a lot of these characters a lot more complicated than although for the commandant I did not believe that scene at all I didn't either but it's what I'm it's, I'm saying that like there was an attempt to yeah, do complex characterization mm. which is often can be just left out of YA yeah. novels because they're like derp de derp de derp um, this is character A this is character yeah. B. So, but, so like, the whole thing, like, she can't, Lia just can't be friends with this resistance guy who's gone through the same thing, and he can't just support her. No, he has to be in love with her. And no, Elias can't just have, like, a friendship relationship with Helene. They have to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you could, they could, Helene and Elias just could have been, like, brother and sister, and the plot could have gone the same way. Um, Smoother. We yeah, would have smoother. spent a lot less. We would have wasted a lot less time. Yeah, right. and that's that's what frustrated me was that I saw it a lot. Honestly, these relationships being more complex and believable if they weren't romantic. Because I mean, the second you pick up the book, you read like the two first sentences on the back of it, and you know Lia and Elias are getting together. You know it. Yeah. It's a why book. What else is going to happen? Yeah. So it's just like I don't know. There was there was so much good characterization that when two of the exact same love triangles happened for no purpose, it was just like oh, you're so close. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so close. All right. Um, but I also would like to make one other comment. Okay. And I wasn't sure if this is just me, so I don't. I usually don't try to like go into Goodreads and check the reviews on a book before we do this because I want my opinion to be unbiased. But I felt uncomfortable about the topic, so I went in and I was like, "Has other people said this, or is it just me?" I know where you're going. Is it the amount that? Oh, and this is like a trigger warning for a hot sec for a mention of rape for anyone who might have that issue. But the uncomfortable amount of times that like the word rape was used as a plot device because I'm, I felt icky. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it up because I would have just been doing the same and I'm sure Michaela would have. Yep. Um Do you wanna do you wanna talk about it first, Gretchen, your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I just I was just uncomfortable about the like the amount of like leering and the cavalier like kind of like cavalier use of like rape and potential rape and I I just I don't even know how to put it into words I was just reading it and I was like this isn't okay like you can't just use rape to make the situation seem more dangerous that's not, mm -hmm. not a thing that you do it's this is far too serious of a topic to just be like every two chapters just like potential rape potential rape boop doop doop uh, yeah. This is actually kind of topical because this is one of my uh, uh, most serious issues with the current writing of the Game of Thrones television show. Yes. In which it rape has become shorthand for a woman's character growth. When they don't know how to exact a change in her emotion or show some significant weight of her situation, they immediately go to rape. And I do not want to accuse uh, Saba Tahir of just using it to make a situation seem a little more dire. 
The way I interpret it, however, is uh, similar to what you mentioned in the introductions, Gretchen, how this is very much a YA text trying to seem a little darker and a little more unique. And this seemed primarily uh, just casually throwing around rape, and it's like, oh, well, did she rape you? How many times have you been raped? All of those. And it was just seeming, it was trying very hard to say, look how dark, look how serious a world, a life experience this is for these characters. And it really bothered me. And it's, again, it's one of those things where she did it so well in other places. I was just like, how is this happening right now? Because, like, I think it's the third trial when they have to fight each other and they have to kill. And, like, the aftermath of that. And I was just like, that was well done. And, like, the whole way that Helene internalizes it versus how Elias internalizes yeah. it. And the fact that you've gotten to know these characters who are then just dead in seconds. And you know that they're friends. And I was like, oh my god, like that that gets me. <laughs> so I was just like, you're doing it so well in other places. Why? Why? So, <laughs> I don't like rape used as, as a plot device in any case. And I felt like it was sort of trying to be like, this is a realistic thing. When a people come and conquer another people, it is a given that rape is going to be happening by the soldiers to the conquered women. That's not... It's, it's a realistic thing. Like, that's not mm -hmm. a stretch of the imagination. However, I don't think... I feel like it was trying to be like, obviously these soldiers are going to rape the slaves, and obviously these soldiers are going to go and rape the women in this tribe. And the soldiers are going to be very casual about it. Right, because that's just, that's their right as the conquerors. Mm -hmm. They get free reign of this place. But it wasn't discussed in a way that seemed real. Like, it, it was like, this is a reality, and it's dark and gritty, and this is real, but it, it wasn't, like, actually, like, maintained in a way. Like, it was, like, picked up and dropped, and picked up and dropped, and picked up and dropped when it was convenient. It wasn't somebody saying, this isn't okay, constantly. Somebody saying, I'm scared of this, constantly. It was just like, oh, yeah, by the way, did you remember that these guys might rape them? Did you? Did you, did, did you remember that? Because that could happen. Well, and that was honestly an issue with some a lot of the grittier elements that kind of came up. And I respect it because this world is really complicated mm -hmm. um, in a way that some YA fantasy worlds are not built um, into. They're just like, whoa, there's dragons and there's magic and wee! <laughs> and this book really took... Um, a sincere attempt to explain a very complicated world, world structure, a history, um, in a way that was accessible for YA readers. Because that's why I don't read high fantasy. Because like when they start to get into the whole structure, then I'm like, I'm bored. Please leave. <laughs> and but this, but so much of the wow, this world is deadly and dangerous, was like told to us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily shown, and that's kind of to be expected because the book, for all intents and purposes, took place in one setting, yeah. which was the school, um, which is another trope that I'm just like, oh, die in a hole, please. Um, yeah, but that trope can actually be done well. Like, oh, if it can. If you're setting a I story in a school, like I would actually like to see an education, which did not happen in this no. But he had graduated already. We didn't need to see the education. Mm. I'm being sardonic. That's I'm not. I don't actually believe that. But that's that's yeah, the no, thing is that he graduated, so we didn't need to see the education. I know, but it just made me think more of how utterly unsold on this whole. We need to train you to be the next emperor, and meanwhile, the emperor is marching on us to kill you. <laughs> that that whole thing. I'm just. What? This is That's what treason? I mean, though. So much interesting stuff was happening off screen while they were over playing four tests. Yeah. And I was like, if I wanted this, I'd go read like 
The Hunger Games, or Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I'm not here for this. And while I think a lot of interesting discussions and good scenes came out of it, I'm just like, I this didn't need... What, uh, I wanted so much more to happen. <laughs> I wanted to see so much more. And I mean... I guess for me it wasn't like you know for it was for you guys but you were just like oh my god this is awful but I'm like oh, okay now I need to read the second book because I like I need to know what the heck is going on because I feel like so much more is going to happen in it. Mm -hmm. um, well, for your sake, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's the thing. Like, that's, and that's the reason I give it four stars on Goodreads is because when it is a debut author, mm -hmm. and I see that this much potential in a book, I will rate it higher than I would normally because I'm like, listen, she deserves to be read now so she can publish and improve. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find that when fair. I get to a lot of second books, like, um, I, I think I wrote, oh, it was the Match series by Ali Condi. I, was, I really liked the first book and I was like, this could go so many good places. And the second book I just hated. And I think that scathing review is still on my blog somewhere. It's really mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm willing to be hopeful for now because I don't have a second book in front of me. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it my turn to rant? Oh, yes. Sorry, yeah. I'm done. I've, so, got things. I've taken a lot of time from this. Yeah. So. Um, I am sort of going to touch on something that Gretchen like talked about briefly with the love triangles, and that was that the... You mentioned that you wish that these relationships could have just been friendships. And I had texted Taylor early on, like when I was like halfway through or something, and had said, you know, I would be completely okay if these two storylines were completely separate storylines. If they didn't need to interact until the end. Right? If, if Elias and Laia didn't, they were just doing their own things and their own problems. And they, they didn't have to meet up any more than they needed to. They didn't even need to be friends for me. They just needed to be people in similar situations of like maybe he does something nice for her like gets her the medicine like he says because he sees his mom hurt her and then later when she's trying to escape and she sees that or even if she was supposed to be killed in that fourth trial and he actively chose not to kill her and she registered that and decides to save him later, they don't need to interact beyond that. That's just somebody doing something nice for somebody who did something nice for them. I didn't need it to be any more than that. I felt like this book, there were so, early sections seemed like they weren't going to cross. And I was like, but they have to cross because it's a YA novel and we already know that they're supposed to fall in love and stuff. And then they had that gross, like, he sees her for the first time scene. But, like, in those early beginning bits, when it just seemed like these were two stories happening concurrently that would connect at some point, I would have been so much happier with this book. And I would have felt like it was so much better because not everything needs to be a romance. I agree with that 10 hundred and 10 million percent. I think that, honestly, when I read YA sometimes, like, I will automatically get frustrated with a book, even if it's not necessarily... I mean, I guess it is a book's fault that's there, but, like, I will give it so much more ire than it probably deserves for me, because at this point, I am just frustrated. On Honestly, I think that friendships can be a lot more nuanced and a lot more complicated um, than... Friend, then, then all this romance that like needs to happen in every book, and I think that's part of it was for me as well. So I was just like, this doesn't need to be a romance. Why right. can't two people join up to save the world who like happen to be straight, a straight guy and a straight girl? You know why? Wh why? Why? They don't have time for this. <laughs> She's got a brother who's in like a death cell, and he's like gonna be executed. You don't. That's what, you don't... like exactly. I'm like they wouldn't be feeling these feelings. They're in dire situations. <laughs> they would be too preoccupied with other stuff. <laughs> I just like I want to read a YA novel where there's like four protagonists, two boys and two girls, or like you know some combination of gay men and lesbians, whatever. I don't care. As long as they, like, are set up as, like, two separate couples who could fall in love. 
And then don't. And then the couple who falls in love gets killed like a fourth of the way <laughs> into the book because like they're too busy mooning at each other to see like the <laughs> deadly <laughs> things charging them. And the two other people are like, nah, man, let's just go. <laughs> They are that couple in horror movies where one of them dies and then the other one breaks down and cries and everybody else is like, for the love of God, just move. Just That's move. That's every novel, though. I don't understand how the world always gets saved when they're like, love me. Like, you know, Michaela? What? Correction, you wouldn't know this because you, you didn't show up to that meeting. Uh, Michaela, I think John dies at the end deals with that very well, actually. In that it does not make a romance until they're pretty well established through the plot. Through Amy and Amy David. And David, yeah. Yeah. And then the second novel actually does that. I'm I'm digressing. I just wanted to remind you. They Gretchen didn't actually David like Gretchen. date until after the danger was over. It exactly. was like a yeah. Wish that he like liked her and that she liked him, but they didn't act on that. And then as soon that. as they did, things went bad. Right, but because again, they I weren't just wanted, <laughs> Exactly. I just I just wanted to bring up how Gretchen missed another one of my book choices. Yeah. I I I would have been happy <laughs> about that. Cause like because it even happens in books that I love, like the final Mortal Instruments book. Mm-hmm. Like, skip the next 30 seconds if you haven't read that book and you want to. Does anyone here want to read that book? Does anyone care if I make a minor comment about it? I can't even and, remember which series The Mortal Instruments is. Well, literally, there's Terry and Jace, one. and by the time you hit the sixth book, they're a pretty established couple. Mm-hmm. But, like, they haven't been able to have sex, and they end up in a hell dimension trying they to They go the through world. six books without having sex? What? Yes. What is this madness? But anyway, they they're in a focused. hell. Dimension. They are being stalked by demons. They don't know if anywhere is safe. They don't know if they're going to get home. Their friends are dying while they're in there. And they decide to have sex while they're in the hell dimension. And there's literally reference to a condom. And I'm just like, yes, this is what I would pack to head to a hell dimension. Weapons, body armor, condoms. <laughs> okay, first off, I think it is very responsible of the author to mention that. As safe sex, even in fiction, is an important thing to remind the audience, especially young, impressionable teens. Yes. Two, when is the next chance you're going to get to bang someone in hell? <laughs> Answer <laughs> me that question. I mean, I love those books. Cassandra, I drove five hours one way to meet Cassandra Clare. I love her. But I was just reading this scene like, guys, you, you got things to do. <laughs> and that was together. not the time. <laughs> Yes. But anyways, I don't know. I, this is also a digression. I'm just like, why in YA novels does it always have to be a romance? I think because the idea is that the majority of people who read YA are girls, and girls want a romance. And I would say that this book, the the like plot elements of this book would be like super great for boys, but as soon as a boy goes, ah, oh, it's a romance, they're not going to read it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, when I, my brother is really big into Roman history, Mm -hmm. and so when I saw this book, and it was, like, based on Rome, and there was, like, this boy soldier, um, because, you know, my brother really likes to read, too, and I was like, this would be a perfect book for me to give him, except for I can't, because of this, this huge romance element that overtakes the plot, and actually, at, um, the academic conference we held at um, at Ithaca in May, Bruce Colville was a keynote, and he actually talked about Bruce how Colville difficult was it a is. Peter Ripley? What? Bruce Colville was a Peter Ripley? Yeah, he was a keynote. For fuck's sake, of all the times I'm overseas. <laughs> he was ama- His keynote was amazing, but my point is, Bruce talked about how difficult it is to keep boys reading, mm-hmm. and it just frustrates me every time people say, well, the YA industry is really, um, you know, it's really a girl's industry when it's like it boys are literally blocked from reading it. That's 50% of the population that you are just denying. You are de- It's the exact opposite of the comic book and video games industry of people just being like, nah, this is for boys. This is, YA is like, nah, this is for girls. Stop that. Just stop doing that. <laughs> Why are you doing 
that. Stop. I, I, oh, guys, you're fighting for me. Thank you. It's evil. I know I'm, I'm being like, snarky about that, but thank you, really. <laughs> I just it makes me so upset. Yeah. Like, cause all I wanna, it's like, it's like, it's not, I'm not even like, I'm getting up my Tumblr horse and I'm like, social crusade. I'm just like, I just want to be able to share books with my brother that I know he would like, except he won't. And I mean, even for me, I'm a girl and I'm sitting here saying, stop with the romance. If I want a romance, I'll go pick up a Harlequin romance and, you know, do that for a couple of hours. Like, and I don't, by the way, <laughs> I don't. Too bad, because we're reading Anita Blake. <laughs> More on that later, guys. I'm fine when it's established like that. That Most is a paranormal romance. Guns, it is part of the genre. YA yeah. is many genres, but every single one of them is like, somebody's got a bang. Well, okay, so you were just saying that if you wanted to read romance, you would read Harlequin, but you don't like doing that. I read romance novels. I greatly enjoy romance novels. Not every book needs to be a romance, and that's what we're saying, is that this book would have been so much better if it wasn't a romance. If it didn't feel the need to conform to a romance. Right. There was something else that I wanted to rant about, but I can't remember it right now. So, Taylor, you should start, and maybe I'll um, remember it and we can come back. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point, because uh, I was rather aggressive in jumping into your guys' rants, mm. especially Gretchen's. Uh, so I got some of the things out of my system. I did want to bring up that very contrived sort of situation where there is only one girl accepted into the Academy. Because... The reason that bothered me so much is because Elias is like, you know what, I don't know why that is the case, but sure is a thing, isn't it? And I'm like, this is something that would be known. Because clearly there has to have been precedent where they say, yes, we will make one exception. But there has to be a very specific reason for that. And if you're not even trying to give us a reason, it's just, we need a token girl in this for a love triangle. And she will be, like, the sexual tension with our protagonist. So here's what I would say to that. If you want to have girls in the military, you make your, like, test to get into the military academy something to do with strength or stamina or something that most girls wouldn't be able to do. So the reason there's only one girl is because she was the only one who was able to pass that test. Mm -hmm. And they, like, sort of talked about how she was wicked, like, fighty good before like, she went there. How she was like the most driven and intense person. Right. The same thing. Like, it goes out of its way to say, yeah, there's only ever one girl in the academy. And I don't know why that's a thing. Hmm. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Odd. Gosh, she's pretty. <laughs> but anyway. Yep. Said it. Was, was that your your last rant? Because we talked about the love triangles and. I mean, yeah, I, I got some other things. Um, yeah. Uh, I was also bothered by why was everyone paying so much attention to, uh, Leon, Ly Lyla, I, I, Lyla. 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 I can never get her name right. Lyla. Why is everyone paying so much attention to her? Because if you take it out of context of her being a protagonist. All the time she's used as bait for Elias before he even like knows her or people like think that she's always specifically being put in front of him. Mm -hmm. And then I mean at the end it made sense that they like made an entire challenge just against him. But before it's like they keep time after time call, like baiting him with punishing her, and it only makes sense because she's a main character. Well, not necessarily though because by the context of the end it seems like the augurs know something's up with her like she's probably involved in some greater prophecy is what they're hinting at at the end and so anything having to do with like the augurs throwing her in throwing her in front of him is them going oh. yeah <laughs> the, the whole augur thing was bothering me because it's like, oh, we don't actually know what their motives are at the end, but at the same time, I'm I'm still struggling sort of just to see why they bothered with most of this. Still. Yeah. 
that was the thing that I wanted to talk about. The augers being all-knowing, except for those two kids who uh, just know how to block block them, because the, the one headmistress knows how to block, and she decided, like, like the, it was this, like, well, if they can read minds, then why doesn't, don't they just know that those guys should, oh, because they know how to block them. What? Well, no, because, but the Commandant was taught by um, the evil king dude man, whose name is, like, Nightshade or something. I, I I understand that, but like that in itself is such like a, a plot device, like the author injecting herself to like make this keep making sense. Because okay, that first trial was they had to face their biggest fear. And for Elias it was the augers putting him into a sort of a magical situation where they like took over his brain for a little while. He had to fight himself. Versus something like Helene's battle, which was very physical fear of heights. Like that, they're like, okay, we just put her up on a mountain. That's easy. But he doesn't have a physical fear. If one of those other boys didn't have a physical fear and had like a mental block, and they were blocking the augers, that wouldn't have worked because the augers would have gone, why can't we mess with that guy? Why can't we do this? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's a very like uncomfortable here's a th reason why this works just because I say it does and because like they she just, they didn't did, seem bothered no like, they're well, like we ah, tried. We can't really do. Well, that, yeah. that's all we can do yeah. let's head home boys um, but I liked the augers as, as a thing of having like mystical wise men for this very like fighting oriented society they all they, like they rule everything they seemed to be like well, everybody respected them, and none of them like, seemed like they were fighters. They were just magic. <laughs> and couldn't die. Well, yeah, you respect those Convenient. who die. <laughs> Gretchen, you, you wanted to say something? Hold on, I have to mute my microphone for a second. Okay. Um, what was I... Right, I did want to discuss a bit this whole Emperor plot line. Mm -hmm. Because there's a whole emphasis saying, like, oh, he's coming to this academy to kill you all because you're getting ready to be his successor. Which yeah. is... I don't know what his motivations in that were, or but why the school was the doing it. If it's like, But the entire school was motivated, like, oh, we need to prepare for the next guy. But at the same time, apparently this is running contrary to the will of the person who is currently leading our country. Whether right. or not he is a successor, he is currently leading our country. And for people who are put so much effort, emphasis into being obsessed with rules, like Helene, who has allegedly never once broken the rules, has no problem with acting in absolute um, words. Yeah, I'm just... But the thing is that it's not, though. Really contrary to his wishes. Go on, Gretchen. But the thing is that it's contrary to his wishes, but it's not contrary to the wishes of the government. Because the prophecy was already in place that this guy's line was going to fail, mm -hmm. and a new, um, a new emperor was going to have to be chosen from the masks. Was so it defecting it to, to the augers? Like, the augers were the ones that said this, so everybody was like, oh, we believe them because they are mystics. Yeah, but even if you know. believe them, if he is currently the leader of your government, it doesn't matter if he won't be your leader of the government in the near future. The fact that he still holds that position of power means you kind of need to listen to him if you uh, claim to obey all of the laws of <laughs> him. But the thing, too, but they were saying with the masks, though, they were saying that um, the masks are kind of a separate entity from the Emperor, like they serve the Emperor, but since this prophecy was, like, related to them specifically, it does seem like they always found themselves, like, mm -hmm. you know, they will serve the good of the country, and when the good of the country is that this guy, you know, this guy's got to mm -hmm. go, that that's the thing. I don't know. I liked it because I was... It just seems mm -hmm. like so often your YA antagonist is like the crazy despot dictator 
who was just like lerp de derp de derp and in this one it was there was a slight mm -hmm. now with Marcus being emperor and him being batshit crazy that's that's kind of come back yeah but I don't know it just I think I would have been more sold on this if we actually saw a conflict with that, especially in the person who keep coming back to, Helene, who has, as I've said many times, has so much emphasis in obeying the laws. I would like to see some doubt in her, some at least thought process, you know, where she says, you know, I understand that isn't the thing, but I am serving what I believe to be a greater good, besides just I want to be well, in she power. kind of does, though. Because no, Helene she just says, become... I want to be in charge. Which I think but runs she... contrary to what we know. But she mm -hmm. is the one, even when she follows orders, she is the one who believes in the augurs absolutely, even when Elias doesn't. Sorry, Michaela wants to speak. That's what I'm going to say. I think that you think the emperor is above the augurs. I think the augurs are higher in the government. Yeah. I think the emperor is underneath them in this country. So if the augurs say the emperor's got to go, even if the emperor's technically above them, the the masks, it's like the president of the company saying something, but the manager saying something else. You can go over the manager and like not give a shit mm -hmm. and like break those rules because he's technically has no power. He's just mm -hmm. a figurehead. All right, so I think I can take away from this is that this is something I would have actually been very interested in to see discussed instead of a love triangle, and I would love to know more, and I think this conflict was, uh, again, interesting. And, well, well I guess it's I mean, too like, bad I didn't I get to hear these the things. the attack on the Emperor happened off-screen, I was mm -hmm. like, no! No! Yeah, that was Why? one hell of a climax. Right? The barbarians don't even get to the gates. They just get pushed off screen by a broom. <laughs> or off they're, they're in the they wings. Get, they get hooked in, in the folly the and pulled off stage. Yes. <laughs> well, and then you have the conflict with the resistance with like Marzin and what's her name? Like Sana. And like the older and the younger and how that plays out and like where did Sana go after the Emperor was killed? If she like she thought they were wait, what? Where'd, where'd she go? <laughs> Donna? Because, <laughs> like, Keenan is there at the end talking about, like, how she's, like, thought that they should get her brother out before they attacked the Emperor, but then she had to go, but then, like, Marzen pulls this thing. So, like, where is she? <laughs> Can we appreciate that super villain monologue of I needed you out of the way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I thought of what my other rant was, by the way, whenever you're done mm -hmm. with this. Laia? I really, 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 really hated her. A lot. <laughs> The whole book. <laughs> My mom and dad were so great. My big sister was so great. My grandparents were so great. My older Remember brother was died? so great. I suck. I suck so much. Hey, hey, Michaela, do you remember? Do you remember how everyone she loved died? And how great they were? Do you know how great they were, Taylor? Because every Wait, single chapter on, she speaks, she remembers that. Wait two pages, you'll hear it again. I know you forgot, don't worry, it'll come around. But her mom was the lioness. Her and she is the was... daughter of the lion. And she probably forgot all these people telling her her mom was an ass bag. She's like, no, I must be more like my mom. Mom was great. And I can completely get, okay, so when somebody dies, especially when a child is young, they put them on a pedestal. I get it. But we don't need to be told that every single chapter. Especially because as soon as we have introduced them there, it's like, no, the more we learn about her mom, the more we realize she was not a good person. No. And her dad was, like, actually a more interesting. And yet... The narrative promptly ignores that. It mentions it a couple more times, but it doesn't internalize it. She doesn't comp 
she doesn't think about that. She just hears it and then continues to think, wow, my mom was great. <laughs> Remember how she... My sister. What was her name? She was... Oh, dead, too. <laughs> oh, also, killing the grandparents in the first... Like, really? Re really? That was... I was just sighing the whole really? time. Really? Really? Uh, You're going to... Kill, uh, kill the grandparents right now. Okay. Still okay. better than the confession of love, which I've already talked about. But mm -hmm. I listened to about half of this as an audiobook because the book was a while coming to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm driving, and he's getting to the part I've already recapped where he's like, "Can like you're in love with me, and like that's just it's throwing off my groove, man. And I'm just I can't do anything. I'm just like, you <laughs> <laughs> that noise for two minutes driving down the road someone looked into my window they thought I was choking to death oh Gretchen's been gone Gretchen are you back? I thought she was just stunned into silence by us no I don't think so Gretchen oh wow hi Here's... oh okay She's hey back. Gretchen what was the last thing you heard so we can recap you and you can comment or fight with us about it if you want? I, um, Elias, but he tells Helene. Um, yeah, okay, like, so it's just me making, like, strange mammalian noises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't really hear a lot of what happened last. I was having internet problems. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just me being me, don't worry. You didn't miss anything. Yeah, and it was just me saying that. Killing the grandparents, why? Why did I do that? She doesn't even actually, like, she registers the fact that they're dead and, like, talks about that, but they were murdered in front of her. Like, we had a whole, like, really graphic scene of, like, the grandmother's neck being slit. Like, yeah. She doesn't actually, like, ruminate on that fact. She's just like, oh, yeah, they're dead. And they'll never get to sell their jam. <laughs> she thought about that Such jam at the, at the festival. Did, you, did it throw you guys off when the mask offered to let uh, Damien, Darian... Darren, uh, Darren, whatever. Declan, Darren... D-bag. Uh, because, like, I, I consider the fact that, like, you know, he's just bluffing. Like he he's gonna let him run, then he's gonna cut him down. But it's like, if the entire raid was to capture him, why did he give him like a legitimate offer to run away? Especially because uh, I thought it was if you I, run, I'm just gonna run this knife through you. Like if you actually no, try to leave, I will murder you because, instead of taking you in. Because <laughs> Lia completely was taken in by that. Because at the end, she's like, even after he gave him the chance to run, he stayed, and I'm a terrible person. Oh, I know. Like, why did the... Why, what? You, you wanted him alive for reasons. What is going on? <laughs> it was really just to hammer home the threat Plot of her twist being raped in the, in next the first book. chapter. Plot twist in the next book, we find out that that guy is actually working undercover for the Resistance and wanted Darren to be alive the whole time. <laughs> he was just threatening to rape her for flavor text. <laughs> you have to, because that's what they do, right? They're a conquered people. They get raped. Yeah, he needed to convince her because she was the only other person in the alley. Despite her being obviously completely terrified anyway. Okay, guys. Why can't I hold all of this confusion? <laughs> Do we want to talk about our favorite characters <laughs> to go back to a positive? Oh, we've taken a long time in the middle, haven't we? <laughs> yes, we have! I forgot there was more to this discussion. <laughs> Did you know that we discussed things other than rats? <laughs> Do you know we have more than rage in our hearts? <laughs> We sandwich the rants between positive notes, though, because that tends to happen. <laughs> like, he's, yeah. these were our favorite parts, and these are our favorite characters, and why? 
It's important to, you know, keep perspective. Yep. Gretchen, did you have a favorite character? I was just laughing because usually I'm the one where, like, and Michaela's going to pick a minor character. And I'm sitting here going, I really like a lot of the minor characters, <laughs> which isn't usually the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, meh. Um, Elias, I thought, had a lot of potential, like the whole, like, like tribes people background. Mm -hmm. I was like, I am interested in you. Sometimes you're just dumb, but I am interested in you. Um, but, like, they were, and I think p maybe part of it might be that in a lot of YA novels, once they hit minor characters, they're like, stock character A, stock character B, here, be free. And there's, like, there isn't really a lot of depth to them. But, like, this from... This character needs to accomplish this, and this character needs to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. There was, like, like the cook. That was a really fascinating thing. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of their classmates, especially. Um, and, I mean, for them, that the third trial wouldn't have had as much of an impact on me if that hadn't been done well. Mm -hmm. But you got, like, you know, the guy with the fiancé, the guy whose brother died, the... Mm -hmm. And it was just, like... One of whom had a Scottish accent, so... Yeah. But, like, a lot of times when minor characters come and go like that, especially when there's that many of them... Yeah. Like, I'm just like, I don't remember who you are, I don't care. Yeah. You know, and this, I was like, I am invested in characters who don't really have a lot of screen time. And I was really, really happy about that. I also just really liked mm -hmm. Izzy. She was just sweet. Can, can I give a positive about Cook? Cook wasn't my favorite yes. character, but I do have a positive about Cook. So coming off of, at the very end, the chapter where Elias asks his questions to his mom, and his mom does her, does her monologue about why she hated him her whole, his whole life, right? We have almost that same scene with, um, Laya and Cook, with Laya being like, ah, oh, this is the only chance I'll have to ask her questions. And Cook says, no. I appreciate that so much. Good job letting us not have to know everything about a character. I am completely okay with that. Not everything needs to be tied up with a little bow. We don't need to know every character's motivations. I'm Knowing that she has had them, it's fine. What were you like, saying, Tim? So who was the No, I'm, I'm glad we up. just had the, those suspicions of maybe this is her, but we don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I agree. Go on. Who is your favorite character? Um. Okay, so I rather liked the uh, Smith guy from In Town, whose name I don't. Oh yeah. Can oh. You... Three times show up, dude, who didn't pan out into anything. Yes, except for the fact that I feel like he should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that was actually going to be the plot. Right? I thought that he was going to be important, and then he just didn't end up being that. And then at the end, he was like, here, have the sword. Just, here you go. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? No. I, what? He, he was a guy who's like, like, he was a guy who was working for this military. He makes their weapons and then just decides, I'm not for this fight anymore, so I'm just not going to do it, and somehow survives that. Like, didn't get murdered for, like, not supplying their army like he's supposed to be doing. He just kept making armor, apparently. Right, and I don't see how a, a, any military would be okay with that, but... No, yeah. There probably aren't very many experts in the area. We get the impression. No, and he apparently well, has like some of the best blades in the country though. anyway. That we don't. That he doesn't make. That he doesn't make. He just doesn't do it. He refuses. <laughs> nah, bro. Nah. <laughs> you wanted That's a sword man. tomorrow. Nah. <laughs> but like. He would have been really interesting to learn more about. I thought that maybe because Darren got taken that Laya was going to he was gonna like take Laya under his wing maybe and like be a confidant mm -hmm. in this like living in between world of like I have to be one or the other. Or maybe yeah. he would have helped 
our male protagonist. Maybe that's what that was like. Lia, he, the male protagonist follows Lia there, and he's like, yeah, I don't want to be here either. And, and they can give pointers on how to survive that sort of nonsense. But it just never happened, and I was kind of sad about that. There was, but, I think it was the first time that she went to see him yeah. that he's like, no way, I want to tell you things. And she's like, no, sorry, bye. And I was like, no. That's this entire book. Yeah. Important things want to happen, and she's like, I have to run back to my lover. <laughs> We saw the plot, and she just didn't take the exit. She kept going. Kept uh, going down that highway. Because, like, every time she was there, he was like, no, I need to tell you something super I, like, I really want, like, for them to, like, go at, at the start of the next book, for our two protagonists to be, like, crawling through the catacombs, and, like, this guy just walks out, stop. <laughs> I have things to tell you. <laughs> to be three hundred pages. <laughs> I've waited long enough. Every time she walks in, he's like, "There was an ancient prophecy," and she's like, "Nah." Comes back in again. These ancient weapons. <laughs> They'll serve you well. Oh, 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 I want to see at the end of the final book, he jumps out and he's like, I have to tell you things. He's like, no, I already know them all. I figured them out. He's like, literally, the first page of the book, I could have had this done. And, you know, we have several points throughout the novel where they're like, how are we going to get the, like, we as the resistance, how will we get you out of the school? I'm like, she walks out of the school, like, running errands regularly. And then she snuck out of the school in a dress with her friend, who she's like, if only I could get her out, too. And I'm like, well, you can just... You both just left! <laughs> you went out in, like, fancy clothes. And, like... Um, and now for my that doorbell parent... just rang. Hold on. But you don't know anyone who wasn't in this call. <laughs> anyway, it's just, just like... They sneak out in presumably what I can only imagine are like floofy dresses and high heels on a mountainside that our Elias, like Super Hulk, uh, best student in the school, was like, I couldn't like get down it without ropes. I like nearly died. I had to turn back. And she's like, what? No, I had like this really skimpy thing on. It was gorgeous. Hold on, it's in my closet. Let me just go. That's it. Sure, but no, it's because we can't goes, get anyone out of this school. Well, can't it's like get anyone out of the school. Something that could be important to the plot? No, I hear the call of my lover. Yeah, they will only ever sneak out of the school for like the the cherry blossom festival. That's it. Which apparently some years they're allowed to celebrate, some years not. But you know, it was a thing. I'm really I'm floundering without Michaela here. She's the one who knows what we go to next. <laughs> I don't well, I mean, you can talk about your favorite character. Yeah, about that. Don't have one? Um there was one character there was one friend at the school who had a Scottish accent from one of the narrators. Mm -hmm. I like I liked him. The cook, I was interested in, but at the same time, I was utterly... She was... Oh, utterly ruined for me, because the narrator had the worst voice for her. And oh, it was yeah! Easy, it was easy to look past when it was just conversation there, because it was kind of raspy, kind of vaguely old woman but just not something you'd really want to hear. And when it was like a couple lines of dialogue, I didn't notice it at all. But then we got to the point where she's telling this legend about the djinn. And so it's ten minutes of this terrible, terrible, grating, awful voice. And I'm like, 
I never want to hear anything ever again. <laughs> it was so... Her character was unfortunately ruined for me by complete happenstance. Mm. Of something that was not even in the writing, because especially as Michaela discussed, her end sort of situation was something that really interested me, and in that I am very pleased with how she cho um, here, chose to conclude that character's arc, and hopefully she will not come back in the second book where someone reveals what actually happened. That would bother me. I'm okay. <laughs> but at the same time, it was really just the voice acting that created on me. Yeah. No going back after. That's my favorite character. The Scottish guy. Sort of. I don't even remember which guy that was describing. I think he lives. <laughs> That's all we have. I think he lives. That's what you got, ladies and gentlemen. Also, by the way, that doorbell ringing was a guy who I think likes my roommate bringing her a mixtape for her drive home tomorrow. Dudes, dudes make mixtapes for people. Did you know that? That's like actually like a pretty decent thing to do. Like, let's do the time warp again. <laughs> Super cute. I, I know. So I'm glad that I got to do that. She's not here right now, so I just slid it under her door. But well, all right. Sometimes okay. What comes uh, after? He was really disappointed. She didn't answer the door. Uh oh. Poor guy. I know. I bet he's in the double love triangle, too. Oh, no. <laughs> no! Um, are there um any main characters that we haven't talked about that we want to touch on more? Um. Nope. I got nothing. I mean, I feel like... We've done a pretty good character spread. Yeah. I think so, too. We have, did we and talk also, about, like, we've already been at this for an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Has it been that long? Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, yeah. My okay. carefully nursed pine is now gone. Oh, no. All right. I think that that is a, that is a good spread of the good and the bad in this book and what we think could have been done better and what we expect from the new one. So I guess that we move on to the next stage of this, which is talking about next time. Um, before we do shout-outs for all of our own personal social media, again, I'm going to say that there is a Goodreads group for this group. There are social media links like Twitter and Instagram and Vine and stuff that are all linked below if you want to know ahead of time what we're reading and where we are in our reading. I'll tell you right now that in two weeks we're going to be meeting to talk about um, 20 short stories from the collected fictions of Jorge Luis Borges. Um, I don't want to have to read out all of these specific ones because there's 20 of them um, right we'll now. We'll be linking them below. Um, well, noting them below. They'll be noted below and on the Goodreads page and on my blog. So if you... All of those links will be down below and you can click on it and find it and know which specific books we're reading and what pages they're on. Um, it's Taylor's Choice. Gretchen might not be with us. Uh, but she's going to be trying to. Right. Because she has prior commitments that week. Um, I also want to say that if you had been planning on reading my pick, which is the last book that we're supposed to be reading the second to last week of August or something, I switched that one to an Anita Blake book because I felt that we needed more sexuality representation in our diverse reads. And I just did pelvic thrust out of the side of the camera. That was unfortunate. Well, <laughs> As in, like, no one could see. Yeah. The, the you wanted the people to see one. the unfortunate part was that people couldn't see, or the unfortunate part was that you did the pelvic thrust? <laughs> I think we should that just was pass it. Off on the audience. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Go on. So, um, yeah, because otherwise we only have Through the Woods. Right. Um, and we already had a couple of Latin American authors, and I had chosen another one, so I figured that it might be good to 
choose a different um, genre of, not genre, but another representation type thing. More representation, more diversity. That's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. And diversity will actually be reflected in the text. Right. Because the main Which character... is not always the case. Yes. Because, you know, people write stories that they want to write that don't necessarily reflect on things. Right. So um, you can check the Goodreads page for that. Also, because Anita Blake is a series, the week before that one, at the end of that video, I'm going to try and do a very quick synopsis of the things that you need to know about the world before going into that book. The book itself stands on its own, but I'm just going to give like a couple of things that might come up and might confuse you because mm -hmm. it's like number 15 in a series, and it's just like some background knowledge. If nothing else, a rundown in urban fantasy. Would right, be and like how the not world... everyone has experience in that. Right. Um, so there is that. That is a slight change in our plans um, that I wanted to mention. Okay, that is everything. Gretchen, give your shout out. <laughs> Uh, like I said earlier, I'm from the blog My Life is a Notebook, which is adkwriter15.wordpress.com. Um, I am also on Twitter um, under adkwriter15, um, and I'm on Facebook under My Life is a Notebook, and Goodreads uh, is my name, Gretchen C. Holmeyer. Um, oh, and my Instagram is adkwriter15. Um, I think that's everything. I don't know. I I don't know. There's a sentence there, and I lost it. If you forgot something, it's linked down below because I'm that kind of person. I link everything down below. Michaela's on top of her shit. I am not. Um. Right. I'm Michaela, as Gretchen just said. I'm from the blog thepiedpiper.wordpress.com. Thepiedpipercalls.wordpress.com. I'm on Twitter at piedpipercalls and Instagram and all that stuff at piedpipercalls. Goodreads is my name. It's linked down below. Um, Taylor and I also have a podcast where we talk about K-pop stuff usually, which we plan on doing another installment of soon, so you can look uh, out for that. If you... Yeah. Yeah, and that comes out on SoundCloud. And also, if you didn't know, this book club comes out on SoundCloud if you prefer listening rather than seeing our pretty faces, but we, we all look so nice, so I don't know why you would do that. I mean, it's probably Taylor. That's Let's be honest here. <laughs> Taylor's me <face> right now. <laughs> anyway, so that's a thing. It's called the Midnight Tea Room. If you would like to go and see that, we uh, we have a banner. We do. We have a banner now. Um, I'm Taylor. I'm at the point in the video where everyone has, you know, signed off on their own. You know, they don't need to hear every shout out. Um, so I'm just going to talk in circles for a couple moments because, you know, that's my luxury and no one can tell me no. Uh, I have a Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, E.T. Greenwood, I sometimes remember. Um, sometimes I talk about things and sometimes I don't. It's often about books or video games and still no one is listening to this. <laughs> I'm just making the other two listen because <laughs> they need to stay polite and listen to my, you know, talking us out of this. I but, really you know, don't. I very can patient. go now. I can go yeah, now. I could, but you didn't. Uh, and I'm going to reward both of your patience by, you know, concluding on that note. All right. So we will see you in two weeks to talk about Borges. Oh. I may see you in two weeks. I may see you in four. Oh, Who and we'll be talking adventure. about it. Bye, guys. <sighs> nice seeing you all. Annyeong. And you have all seen me, so it doesn't work that way.